Today I'm bringing you the sequel to my Sony picture profile comparison video from early 2019, but this one's going to be bigger, better, more practically useful, and utilizing the A7S III. Let's get undone. What's happening everybody? I'm Gerald Undone, and now this is Pod Racing. Okay, first off, big thanks to Storyblocks for sponsoring this video. They make it possible to produce guides like this for free. And so if you appreciate this kind of content, please listen to this message and check out Storyblocks using the link in the description below. So why would you need Storyblocks? Well, they offer a massive library of stock footage with unlimited downloads and 4K video. So if you didn't get quite enough coverage of the panda you were shooting for your nature doc, and you feel like banging your head against the wall because you don't have the budget or access to reshoot it, fear not, Storyblocks has you covered with panda footage guaranteed to entertain your audience. Best of all, the clips are royalty free for both personal and commercial use, so you can use them as much as you want, wherever you want. And they've recently just launched Maker, an easy to use video editing tool that allows members with an active subscription to edit their videos online within Storyblocks with direct access to templates, animations, and the entire library of Storyblocks assets. Again, link in the description below. Okay, so let's start this video by comparing the synthetic measurements of dynamic range and then move into some more practical comparisons and we'll cover noise, color accuracy, exposure, and post-processing along the way. For those synthetic measurements, I used Imitest to measure the dynamic range and signal to noise ratio of most of the gammas in the A7S III. This was made possible thanks to DSC Labs who provided the Xyla 21, a chart that gives 20 calibrated stops of light. I also tested the color accuracy using DSC Labs chroma charts. They make the best charts in the business, hands down. All right, let's go through the results. Okay, so for each one of these here, I've got three images to show you. I've got the Imitest results, I've got the waveform, and then I've got the actual recorded image. This is, this is what the Xyla chart looks like when you record it, then this is what the waveform looks like in Resolve, and then when we process the Xyla chart image, this is what we get from Imitest. Now, before we go into this too deeply, because CineD just posted their uh, A7S III deep dive video. And just in case some of you have seen both and you want to know why do my dynamic range results seem different in Imitest than theirs, I've tried to follow the same protocol to make it easy for you to look at both results for different cameras that mix and match. Unfortunately, they're still using an older version of Imitest, which uses quality-based dynamic range analysis, and I'm using a newer version, which uses slope-based dynamic range. Now, they're not doing anything wrong. They're actually doing the right thing because they're keeping it consistent against all of their old results, which is really the only way to do it if you want a benchmark. You need to keep the same test going. For me, because I got into it later on, you can't do quality based anymore on the newer version. So all of my results for all the cameras I've tested in all my videos have been slope based. So you can still use all of my results within themselves. But if you're comparing them to CineD, there might be about half a stop difference with my results being maybe half a stop more optimistic. You can probably use that, I guess, for comparison's sake, if you want to compare to CineD with other cameras they've covered. However, don't worry too much about this. These numbers are just synthetic. They're exactly that, which means they're good for a benchmark. You can see which profile is better than another profile or which camera is better than another camera, but you shouldn't take this number to mean anything outside of that. So here, for instance, under slope-based DR, we can see a score of 12.8. That's, I guess, like 12.8 stops is what it was able to see in Cine 1. And at the top, you can always see the profile. So this is Cine 1 ISO 64. And that's the base ISO. All of these are going to be at their base ISO. So if you want to know what the base ISO is for each gamma, it's going to be written right beside it there. But then if we look at the medium score, the one that's a 0.5 medium, this will give us a signal to noise ratio analysis of two. This is considered to be pretty good. Like that, that would be like good, clean, usable stops. So we get a 12 there. So we definitely lose some from total scene to clean stops. And those are the two that I'm going to be talking about, those two numbers as we go through here. And the other way that we can look at this is if you go to the actual Xyla 21 chart, and you start counting stops, you can see that after, you know, around 12 stops, it starts to sort of fade into oblivion in the black, and it's also heavily populated with noise. And if we look at this thing here, we can also count stops. So say that we counted from the top here, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. This is that 12 stop, which is really close to the noise floor. That's this sort of white bar that runs across here. Anything that's in and around or under this white bar is just lost the noise, and it's not going to be useful. Now, if we move on to the next one here, you'll see that it's also Cine 1, but this time it says 109%. And I didn't do this for every profile, but I did it for two, just to give you an example of this. Each one of these profiles, well, some of them have the ability to go above 100%, and it's called like super whites, and it's when you exceed the 100% clipping point for regular broadcast. Those don't really get counted. If you look at the waveform, you see how this is clipping and it's beyond. So that's going to affect your dynamic range reading with this Imitest result. So I did it twice. I did one, which is, as we can see here, this is if I didn't do anything, I just let the super whites clip. And then for the earlier one, 
I brought the super whites back down and kept them within range and then ran an analysis that way. And the difference that you'll see is that you gain about a stop. So regular Cine 1 right out of the camera is going to get us 11.1 .1 if you look at the medium score here. Uh, that is 11.1, .1, you know, usable stops rated right to the camera without doing any adjustments in post. But if we recover our super whites, we can get that up to 12 stops. So there's about a stop extra above 100% that a lot of these profiles have. And we're going to talk a lot about this when it comes to what makes a profile easy to use or not. Because if you want maximum dynamic range, you can't just use it right out of camera because you're going to lose about a stop because of those super whites. So the next one that we have here is Cine 2. It also has 12 stops. Now this one didn't have to be recovered because there are no super whites. It clips at 100% and that's going to be probably our easiest profile. Again, we'll talk about it later on. If you want to see these charts, I'll leave them up so you can pause and look at them if you want. I'll move slowly. Those are the Cine 2 ones. Then we've got Cine 3, which got 12.1 and this is what it looks like here and here. And then Cine 4, which also got 12.1 and here and here. Now for all of those Cine's, I recover the super whites. If you recover the super whites, they all get around 12 stops. If you don't and you let them clip, then you lose about a stop on Cine 1, Cine 3, and Cine 4. Cine 2 does not have super whites. Now let's move on to this one. This is HLG. Now this is HLG regular and ISO 100 is its base ISO and we have 11.8 stops. This one also doesn't have super whites. It clips at 100% or like 99%. And that's what it looks like. And that's what it looks like there. HLG 1. Now HLG 1 is different. It clips a lot lower. And the whole point of this one was that they claim that it gives you noise reduction. And we're going to talk about that when we talk about noise. Basically the whole thing is shifted down. So your clipping point is a lot earlier. I think it's like 85% or something like that. Uh, but the whole image will kind of look darker. And if we look here, you can see where it's clipping now. This is ettr all the way up here. HLG 2, on the other hand, does half of that. It's kind of like a halfway in between regular HLG, well, HLG 3 and HLG 1. Um, HLG 3 is very similar to HLG, a little bit different though. So HLG 2 is halfway in between. Some of the noise reduction of HLG 1, but not all of it, and it doesn't have as low of a clipping point. If you look, it's up here, which I think it's like 95% or maybe 93%. I'd have to look these up. By the way, I get asked about that all the time. Let's just do it right here on the fly. So if ever you want to know about these Sony picture profiles and you want the answers real quick, maybe you're out and about, the best thing to search for is type in Sony Help Guide Basic contrast. If you type that in, I didn't even spell contrast right, but it'll give you the result. And you can see here, movie still, all the cines, the S-Log 2 and 3 and the HLG, and it'll tell you everything you need to know, like maximum video output level for HLG 1 is 87%, for HLG 2 it's 95%. If you want to know for, you know, Cine 1, if it exceeds the 100%, it says so right there, 109%, but Cine 2, 100%. So setting basic contrast, Sony help guide, and you'll be able to pull that up whenever you need it. So that's our answer to where does HLG2 clip? It's 95%. So things are pushed down a little bit. So the noise floor is going to be buried a little bit, but not as much as HLG1. Oh, and the dynamic range score from Imitest for HLG2 was 12.2, and it was 12.2 for HLG1 and 11.8 for HLG. And a lot of that has to do with that noise. Imitest can kind of be fooled a little bit if you do like extra noise reduction. You can, you can kind of beat it a little bit, which is what those HLGs are doing. Now HLG3 comes in at 12.3, which this is a correction I should make. On my original Sony a7S III video, I said that HLG3 got 13 stops. I'm not sure if there was something wrong with that test. I didn't have a lot of time with the pre-production camera, or maybe if something's changed since the pre-production. It's probably just an error on my part, but I've run all these like three times now, and I'm getting 12.2, 12.3 with HLG3 pretty much every time. But if we compare HLG3 on the waveform here to HLG0, if you want to call it that, you do see that there's a difference in the shadows. You see how these are getting lifted up? and then these are pushed down more. That's a little bit of that HLG noise reduction. It still exists in HLG3, but it doesn't really exist in the base HLG. One thing I should touch on though before moving forward with the rest of the profiles is RAW. I've been asked a lot on social what the dynamic range of RAW is. It's not really how it works. RAW doesn't have a different dynamic range. RAW just refers to the data coming off the sensor in its RAW pure form. You're still going to have to sculpt that raw data into a picture by giving it a picture profile, if you will. That means you're going to have to assign a color gamut and a gamma to it. And when you do that, you're going to have to choose one of these, or maybe they restrict you to just using S-Log3, let's say, in which case the results should be very similar to just the results of S-Log3. It's not a different picture profile, if that makes sense. It's, it's the same. You still have to choose one of these gammas. So let's move on to the next one here. What do we got? So PP off. Now you'll see in parentheses it says movie. Something you should know about the Sony cameras is that the movie gamma 
is the same gamma that you get when you turn picture profile off when shooting video. If you're shooting photos, PP off is the same as still gamma. The dynamic range of PP off, I have 11.9 stops. And the base ISO is ISO 80. This is another one where I did the recovering of the super whites because yes, even movie gamma or PP off exceeds 100% and go up to 109%. So we got 11.9 stops. Now let's jump ahead to, and that's what it looks like there with the super whites recovered up top there. And now let's jump to PP off movie at 109% without the super whites recovered. We dropped down to 10.9 stops. So this is the lowest you're going to get on this camera is 10.9, which would probably be like 10 and a half for CineD's version of testing it. And similar to what you would get with like the Sony a7 III. But if you recover the super whites, you do get an extra stop there. And you can see on the waveform, this is what the super whites look like when they're not recovered. There's a full stop above 100% that we're not seeing anymore. Now we've got S-Log2. I got 12.7 stops here. And this is what it looks like on the waveform. And this is what the shot looks like there. And S-Log3. 13 stops. So S-Log2 better than all the other profiles, but not quite as good as S-Log3, which comes in at 13. I already shared these numbers on my review. S-Log3 has the best score at 13 stops. And here's what the waveform looks like. And what I like about S-Log3 is that each one of the stops has a pretty even distribution. It almost looks like a perfect staircase. But I think that that's it for the Zyla 21 information. So if you just want to know the synthetic dynamic range, it's S-Log3 is best. Picture profile off movie gamma with uncorrected super whites is the worst. And then most of the cine gammas and HLGs are in between at about 12 stops. Okay, now let's take a look at those results, but how they would look in a dynamic scene. This is my favorite way to test dynamic range practically. Often you'll see tests where a shot is taken twice at two different exposures, and then they'll measure how well those shots can be normalized. This can be a useful indicator of how recoverable a camera's image is, but it's not dynamic range by definition. Dynamic range is a ratio between the values that can occur simultaneously. So for that, we need to set up a scene that best demonstrates this. Okay, so this is the scene here. You can see that I'm in shadow and I'm holding a color checker so we can use that for reference, including middle gray. And then outside we have a bright sky and the exposure is to make sure that the sky is protected. So that's why I'm so dark because we expose for the sky, not for me. All the super whites are protected and brought back down in each one of these shots, which is why with PP off, I go pretty much into black in order to protect the highlights fully. So this will give us the maximum dynamic range for each one of these profiles. And we're also shooting at base ISO. So we're going to get the lowest ISO induced noise for each one as well. And all of these are ettr we're going to talk about that a lot, which means that they're exposed all the way to the right, meaning that we've exposed to the brightest that we can on the histogram without letting the things that we don't want to clip clip. In this case, that's the sky. So the sky is exposed all the way to the right. Now, when doing this, each one of them has their own clipping point, which I've already talked about. But you need to make sure that you ETTR if you're going for best noise performance with aperture. You open up your aperture to actually let more light in not boost the ISO. The only exception here is that if increasing the ISO would allow you to switch to the second native ISO of a dual gain circuit, then you would actually see benefit from increasing the ISO to ETTR. But typically, if you're staying within a single circuit, increasing the ISO will also kind of uh, increase the noise in the shot in sort of an evenly scaling way. So you're not really getting any benefit typically by ETTRing with ISO, you want to let more light into the sensor, which is what we did here. All of these have the same base ISO, but they're exposed with aperture. And something interesting that you'll notice is that if the aperture is the same, so in this case, I think that let's say they were, I don't know, F, F11, okay? I don't remember what they were. All of the ISOs for each picture profile are, are relative to each other. So F11 on PP off at ISO 80, will be exposed correctly to the right, the same way that ISO 640 F11 for S-Log3 will be exposed correctly to the right. ISO 80 and ISO 80 aren't the same, but they each have their own base ISO and they each scale at the same rate. So if you wanted to move up one stop on PP off, you'd go to 160, where on S-Log3 you'd go to 1250, that would be another stop up. And then 160 over here and 1250 over here, again, would be the same and they would achieve the same exposure. I think this is what some of the confusion comes from when people compare, say, ISO 3200 in one profile versus another. Well, ISO 3200 in S-Log is not the same as ISO 3200 in Cine or in Movie Gamma. So they have to be compensated for by moving up from the base the same amount of stops. Hopefully that makes sense. Actually, while we're talking about clipping points and exposing to the right, I want to show you something on the Sony camera. Now, I'm going to screen record what I'm seeing on the screen with the Atmos, but there is a limitation here. The zebras from 
the Sony don't get outputted to the Ninja. So I can't actually show you the zebras being on or off, but hopefully this will still be a useful demonstration. So if we point the camera at a really bright source like this, and then we bring up our zebra menu, you see how if we go down to C2 here, we have the option to set a lower limit. If you have a source that's definitely clipping, without a doubt, like jack your ISO up to 10,000 if you want, make sure that it's clipping. As you increase the lower limit percentage, there will be a point where the zebras disappear. At that point, that's your clipping point. The zebras stop working when you've exceeded your clipping point. So for S-Log3, like I said, you're not gonna be able to see it, but it would be like this. Say we start at 89, you would have zebras on this light, and you'd still have them, have them, have them, and then when you hit 95 plus, they would disappear. So then you know you have to go back down to 94 plus, and that's where you should set your maximum point, like never let anything exceed 94. And if you wanted to add some safety, you could go down a couple more percentage points from there as well. And this will work for every profile, but when you switch to Cine 1, for instance, you'll be able to go all the way up to 109 plus, which is the top, and you'll still have zebras because that's the maximum one that it's allotted for. But now you know how they're all exposed, they're all at their own clipping point. I'm just gonna click through and you can see the profile and the ISO, the base ISO, and then you can see how much of me sort of appears out of the shadow. So at PP off, I'm the farthest down in the shadow. Let me put the waveform on too. And then this is Cine 1, I come back a little bit. Cine 2, it's sort of somewhere in between. Cine 3 is about the same as Cine 2, but the highlights change. You can see, I'm not gonna give a commentary on each one, but there are a couple things that are important here. When we go to S-Log 2, now all of a sudden we've seen the shadows a lot more, and when we go to S-Log 3, it's even more still. So this is where the actual advantage of S-Log 3 comes in, is that you can preserve the highlights and still see way more into the shadows than with other profiles. And this often causes a misconception in having people think that there's more noise in S-Log 3 than there is in Movie Gamma or something like that. A gamma doesn't create noise. There's not more noise in one gamma than another. What changes is the position of elements in the frame, the, the luminance values of those things in the frame relative to the noise floor. So if you have something like PP off that is very black, that's because it pushed the noise floor all the way down. And you can do this kind of in post if you just go like this and bring my, me down in the shadows, well now, oh look, there's no noise in S-Log3 anymore. There is HLG, you can see it's definitely darker, then HLG1 is even darker, and this is important because HLG1 claims that it hides more noise and has a lower clipping point, and you can definitely see the sky got darker and I'm hidden more in the shadows now. HLG2 should be a little bit less so of that, and then HLG3 less so as well. But now when we correct all of these images to put middle gray at the same point, this is gonna be that uh, shadow recovery thing that I talked about. But in this case, these aren't two separate shots. This is the exact same shot that happened at the same time. All I've done is now boost it to bring middle gray to the same point. And I did that because I wanted to have a uniform sort of exposure here. So for PP off, this middle gray chip is now at the same level. I put it around 42, 43%, the best I could on the waveform. And I did that for every single profile. Now the sky is gone. We're not gonna be able to expose somebody in shadow for perfect middle gray and keep the sky. That's just, I don't know any camera that can do that. But what we should look at is probably the exposure on my knuckles and this part on the curtain that's kind of blown out. But if we switch to Cine 1, you can see that a lot more of the curtain came back. So it is doing better to retain those highlights when we bring up the middle gray. Cine 2 looks pretty similar. Cine 3, pretty similar as well. And Cine 4, Cine 4 doesn't do quite as well in the highlights, but it has a bit more contrast. And that's kind of what Cine 4 does. I think it has like a, a more severe S curve than some of the other Cine profiles, which is why some people like using it for straight at a camera because it already has a bit of contrast to it. Now let's jump over to S-Log2. And now you can see that S-Log2 doesn't seem like it changed that much in the shadows, and that's because those shadows were already raised in S-Log2, which means we didn't have to boost it as much, which means we actually keep a lot more information. Not only is the curtain now not clipping at all, we'll jump back to Cine 4, S-Log2, but the bar here on the window is actually has detail in it, and you can even see a little bit of tree in the sky, which you couldn't really see before. And if we go to S-Log3, it's even better still, and this should be a pretty convincing example of why S-Log3 is the best in this camera. The curtain is perfect, my skin is perfect, the window column is almost completely there, and we've started adding extra trees into the background now. So S-Log3, S-Log2, Cine 3. S-Log3, you can see it's significantly different, and that's one example of how dynamic range can be seen actively in a dynamic scene with two things going on at once. Now, if we actually look at the noise here, let's play this back a little bit, the S-Log3, so we can see how much noise we have. And I know this is YouTube, so it might be difficult to see, so let me let me punch right in here to a high percentage, and we'll look at this area of the skin tone on the color checker. So, very noisy, right, definitely. 
But let's go back to PP Off, which had some of the best noise originally. And you can see that it's very noisy as well, but it might actually look worse. And if we look at my skin, there is a lot going on here that doesn't look good versus S-Log3, which was this one, I think. So the noise is still there. That's because the noise was always there. It didn't change. All that changed was where the image lived relative to the noise floor, which is why exposure is the most important thing when it comes to noise. If you underexpose, you're putting your image into that noise floor. The gamma doesn't matter. How you work with the gamma is what matters. HLG, HLG1, again, look how much darker you can see HLG1 now. You can really see how those blacks are pushed down. Middle gray is the same now, but the blacks are like really pushed down. HLG2, a little bit less so, and then HLG3, a little bit less so, but now you can see the difference between HLG3 and HLG. When you recover middle gray, HLG, the whole scene kind of comes up a little bit, where HLG3, the darker blacks that are noise reduced a little bit still stay down there, and the middle gray comes up differently. Oh, and while we're talking about this whole shadow stuff, just a quick note on the dynamic range optimizer. I get asked about this a lot too. The First of all, don't use it. <laughs> I know that you may have experience where you use it and you like the results or whatever. The, the dynamic range optimizer is just image processing, which means that if you do turn it on and you see a difference, that same difference could be achieved in post. If you raise the shadows in camera with the DRO and then you raise them in post, the noise is going to go up in both. They're going to look the same. And in many cases, the dynamic range optimizer won't even do anything because it only works if your image is like not exposed correctly or if it thinks there's room for improvement, which means you should probably just expose your image better and use the correct gamma for what you're shooting, don't rely on the dynamic range optimizer. Okay, so if we know that you can beat the noise by getting it above the noise floor, the question becomes, how much do you have to overexpose S-Log3 to beat the noise floor? Or at least get noise that's similar to what you would get from movie gamma. And I keep using movie gamma because it has the least noise straight at a camera. So if we're trying to get to that result, how much do you have to overexpose S-Log3? The answer I found is about 1.66 stops. And I'm gonna be able to demonstrate this with a few images that I have here. So for this first shot here, you can see it's S-Log3, 41% middle gray, ISO 640 base. What that means is that I expose this middle gray bar where the text is to 41% in camera. And remember when I showed you on the zebras how if you go to C1, you can set it to, I'll just show you again. Okay, so this is how you would expose for middle gray the, the most accurate way. Get yourself one of these. This is just a gray card. It's an 18% gray card. Look for that. You can get it on Amazon, probably like five or ten bucks for like three of them or something. Get a size that works for you, one that you can keep with you that won't be an issue. This, when we when the when you look up a profile and it says S log three should be 18% reflectant, should be set to 41% or whatever. They want this to read 41%. So you put this in your frame, put this under the lighting that you're trying to expose for. If it's for your talent, you could put it here like this. But put it in the frame and then point your camera at it and then go down to those zebra settings. And I like to use C1 standard range, and then you change this number to be whatever you're aiming for. So in this case, 41%, and then set the plus or minus, which can be all the way up to, I don't know, 10, but set it down to plus or minus one. So that way you know you're gonna get very close to 41%. Now again, I'm not recording zebras in the camera here, but let's say that I was, then we would come in and we would adjust our exposure. Say we were gonna get there with ISO. We would increase the ISO or decrease the ISO until this card was filled mostly with zebras. And that'll let you know that that card is at 41%, or at least the section that's covered in zebras are at 41%. Then when you have that, you know that you're good to go. So anytime you see me say that I expose middle gray to whatever percentage, I used a gray card in zebras and I set it to a percentage and then it changed my exposure until the zebras appeared on the gray card. This is the cheapest thing you can get to get better exposure. And then if you wanna use things like LUTs and transforms, if you dialed that in, those LUTs and transforms should work a lot easier, which is why log is actually the easiest gamma to use, but we'll talk about that at the end. Okay, let me stop recording this. All right, now back to what I was talking about, about overexposing by 1.66 stops. What that means is that that middle gray exposure of 41% is going to be 1.66 stops higher than 41%. It doesn't mean that your camera meter says plus 1.7. It can if the meter does a good job, but often depending on what's going on in your scene, you can't really trust that meter and the meter works differently depending on the gamma that you chose. So I don't like it so much. What I'd rather do is just increase that zebra number. So rather than 41%, if we increase it 1.66 stops, you'll probably end up somewhere around like 55%. So you can set your zebra to 55% and then expose middle gray for that 55% and you'll naturally be 
one and a half to two stops brighter than you would have been if it was set to 41%. So in this image here, middle gray is exposed to 41%, which is exactly what uh, S-Log3 wants if you use any kind of like by the books, uh, transforms or LUTs. And you can see if you look at my nodes here, color space transform, if you don't use resolve, that's okay. First of all, use resolve, it's so much better for color work, but if you don't, you can do all this with LUT calc or just by using manufacturer LUTs. I have a whole another video on doing that. I'll give you a little bit of tips at the end of this video, but you should definitely watch the video. It's like an hour long and explains everything. But over here, you can see that we're converting S gamut 3 Cine, which was the color gamut that we used, and S-Log3, we're converting it to Rec. 709. It says use timeline, that's because my timeline is Rec. 709, so it just converts it to that. And if you saw what it looked like before, this is what it looks like right out of camera, and then when we add that conversion, boom, it just finishes the image, and everything looks great, and it fills from top to bottom on the waveform, and everything's perfect because it was expecting middle gray to be 41%. So if we set middle gray uh, with using PP off to 41%, so that means middle gray is exposed the same on both these profiles. And to do that, I had to boost the ISO in order to keep the f-stop the same so we could see sort of where the you know relevant ISOs were. And for this one, I had to put an ISO 250, which coincidentally is also 1.66 stops above base. But if we look at the shot, we can see that PP off has clipped. It's, it's clipped over here in the skin tones where S-Log3 has not clipped those, even with that Aperture MC shining light directly on. That light was set to 100% shine right on those skin tones, and it didn't clip them, where PP off, obviously, they're clipped quite badly. Now this next one is PP off with the gray exposed the 20% middle gray, which is what happens if you leave it at ISO 80 base. So that's the difference in these two profiles. This is what 41% middle gray looks like, and that's base ISO of 640, but if you use base ISO of PP off, it looks like this, it's much darker, but that's what's required to stop these from clipping. Remember when I said that if the aperture is the same, any two profiles, when set to their base ISO, will clip or not clip the same? So if S-Log3 doesn't clip at its base ISO, PP off won't clip at its base ISO either, which is kind of interesting, and I don't think a lot of people know that. So as you can see, the skin tones are not clipping here, but middle gray is much lower, and that's just the way that PP off is, or movie gamma. It pushes down the shadows more than S-Log3 does, which is why people think it has better noise performance. But if we boost that up to get the same 41% middle gray, so I had to boost it up in post, which is why you can see this sort of strange curve I made here, that's the sort of counteract the movie gamma to make it seem a lot more like S-Log3. You can see if I switch back and forth now, they look very similar. Well, now if we take a closer look at the noise performance, let's look at the noise that we'll get out of, actually, I think the top corner is the best example here. Let's take a look at the noise up here. Now there's not a lot of it because we're at base ISOs, but I'll zoom way in so you can see it. So this is the noise from PP off boosted to get middle gray correctly. And this is the noise from S-Log3. You can see they're very similar. So now what if we do the opposite? What if we expose normal and then expose S-Log higher by 1.66 stops and then bring it down? So what do we got here? We've got S-Log3, the 55% middle gray tip that I showed you. So if we hide this stuff, we can see now when we add the same conversion, you see how blown out it is? That's because that transform was expecting 41% and we gave it 55 and so it's blown out. So earlier on in the chain, we have to bring that exposure back down so that when we give the transform or the LUT, the image, we're giving it the 41% but we've pulled the noise down with it. And I did that in Resolve just by lowering the offset. So this offset is at 10.10, .10. normally it's at 25 up here. And I just brought this down and I would have just dialed it in until I looked at the waveform and thought, yeah, that looks like about 41% middle gray. And then now when we turn the transform on, we have a completed image, which again, should be pretty similar. Middle gray should be where it should be. And these things over here aren't clipping and everything's good to go. But if we compare it to this one, which is PP off, not only will these images be very clean, but again, they should be the same. So this is PP off, which is very clean, even at, I'm 250% zoomed in and I can hardly see it on my screen. And then let's switch to the S-Log3 one that was brought back down and play it. And again, both look equally clean to me. So that's two ways. I'm just gonna recap this because it's kind of weird. If you expose S-Log neutrally, it might appear to have some noise to it. But if you expose PP off neutrally as well, but then you have to boost the shadows, the noise is the same. Conversely, if you expose PP off or Cine or any other gamma neutrally, and then expose S-Log3 higher than it and bring it down, 
again, it's similar. Also, when it comes to when should you use neutral exposure then, the 41%, because that's the easiest workflow and that's what's recommended. Anytime that your whole scene is like already above the noise floor, because maybe you're out shooting at the beach and it's bright, most of your scene is probably going to be above the noise floor. So you can shoot at 41%. And then just use a simple letter transform and it's probably fine. And in a scene like that, the result might be better than using a different technique because you can save more highlights and you don't have to worry so much about noise. But it might seem counterintuitive, but the darker that your environment gets, the brighter, the more you should overexpose in order to bury that noise. Where I think a lot of people think if it gets darker, I shouldn't crank up my exposure because then I'm going to be adding noise. As long as you're not cranking up your exposure with ISO, but you're cranking up your exposure by letting more light in, you're going to do a lot better. Unless, of course, again, it's a dual native sensor, which this camera is. Despite the fact that Sony won't officially say it, I'm now going officially on record and saying it is a dual native sensor, and I have sort of like uh, proof of this. And Philip Bloom and I have already talked about this, and he already made a video where he demonstrated this, but basically every single gamma in this camera, if you expose it 4.33 stops above base, it will get cleaner. It will flip over and get cleaner. And by the way, a correction on my original video, I said that that switched at 16,000 for S-Log3 and S-Log2, and it did. But they've since changed that. It's 12,800 now, which coincides with that 4.33 stops in every profile. It was kind of a weird, almost like a bug in the pre-production version. You could go up to 16,000 and then it would switch, but then you could come back down a notch to 12.8 and it would still stay clean and it wouldn't go back to noisy until 10,000. So I think they just kind of fixed that and said, it's just 12.8, it switches at 12.8 now. Um, so that's the new one. And 12.8 is exactly 4.33 stops above 640, which is the base ISO. But it's the same thing with every other profile. Okay, so I figured the best way to demonstrate this would be to go through some shots together. So here is my studio, and right now it's quite well lit. The, the, the exposure level of most of the things in the scene are quite high. So we could probably expose this neutrally. But I also want you to take notice of the gray card that I have sitting right there on the shelf, because we're going to use that to set the 41% or the 55% zebra point off of that card. Okay, so with the zebra set to 94%, you can see that that panel is clipping, which means that information is going to be lost. And if we go to C1 and set to 41%, you can see that the gray card right there has zebras on it. And I don't know if we can magnify that. Let's try. You can. So you can magnify and you can see that the zebras are there on the gray card. So right now we know that this scene is set to 41% middle gray. And a scene like this is probably fine to shoot neutrally on. This would be right around the limit. If you shoot outside, you can definitely shoot at 41% middle gray. But now let's turn some lights off so that we can see what it looks like when it's a lot darker in here. So let's change the exposure so that we can get to that 55% middle gray. So let's go down here and we'll change C1 to 55%. And if you really want maximum noise reduction, you could probably bump this up to 60 if you wanted. But I'm going to stick with 55 for now because I, I think it's enough. Now to achieve that exposure, we can do two things. We can either increase the ISO, which will increase the noise floor as we go up until we hit the dual native ISO, then the noise floor will go back down or we can open up the aperture. So let's start with opening up the aperture and then we'll lift up the ISO and then we'll compare the two. Okay, so I've actually increased the ISO just to make the results a little bit more noticeable on YouTube. So we're at ISO 3200 right now, F5.6, and we are achieving a 41% zebra on that chart right there. So this is our neutral exposure for ISO 3200. Now, I could definitely open up the aperture and lower the ISO and that would probably give me a cleaner result. We can do that right now to compare. So I'm going to lower the ISO to base ISO, which is 640, and then I'm going to open up the aperture until I get 41% zebras again. There we go, at about f2.5. So I'll now on the screen, I'll compare this image to the previous image of 3200 f5.6 for you to see the difference in the noise. But now let's turn the lights off. And so now I'm going to have to open up the aperture until we hit that 41% middle gray, which is here at f2.8. So this is what that looks like. But now let's try overexposing because this scene is quite dark. So I'm gonna change my zebras to 55%. And then now I'm gonna have to open up even more to about here, f1.8. And that's showing, it actually is showing plus 1.7. Here, let me show you on the, I'll record it with my phone again. So you can see that we have zebras on that middle gray card and we're hitting about 1.7 on the meter. We're at ISO 3200 F1.8. So this is overexposed and our zebras are set to 55% plus or minus one.
So we'll see how this compares to the neutral exposure of S-Log3 when the lights were on. And now let's switch to a different profile, PP off, to compare the noise to see if S-Log truly does have more noise. Let's do that now. Okay, now you're looking at a shot. This is PP off and it, the meter is set to neutral. It's set to zero on the meter. So this is correct exposure for movie gamma. And we'll see how the noise from this compares to the noise from the shot that we just took. Okay, now we're back to S-Log3, and I wanna show you an example of when you can achieve the exposure with ISO, and it's when you switch over to the other dual native circuit. So I'm gonna move the ISO up, and I'm gonna do it until the gray card hits 55% again. And at 12,800, it's gonna get so much cleaner. So let's boost the ISO to 10,000 first, which is the worst possible ISO on this camera. 10,000 is the worst and then it gets much cleaner. And for that, I'm gonna have to open up one third of a stop on the iris in order to hit that 55%. Or as you can see on the meter there, it says plus 1.7 stops. And this is gonna be overexposed to hit the correct target, but I'm doing it with ISO and the image should be much noisier than the one that I showed you earlier. But now let's increase the ISO one more third of a stop to 12,800 and we can stop down a third, and now we've switched over to the second native ISO, and the image will be much cleaner. So this is the only exception to when raising the ISO doesn't raise the noise floor, and you can get away with this. And again, every profile has this, just 4.33 stops above its base. And here's a fun little trick to remember where the second native ISO is for each profile. It's 20 times the base ISO. So for S-Log 2 and 3, the base ISO is 640, and so if you multiply 640 by 20, you get 12,800, which is where the second native ISO is. And this works for all the profiles, you just have to round with a couple of them. The ones that have the base ISO of 64, well there is no ISO 1280, so it's obviously ISO 1250. But yeah, just multiply by 20, if that's easier for you to remember. Okay, now let's talk about color, because I don't wanna talk about gamma anymore for a minute. So for each picture profile, there's two main settings. There's the color gamut, and then there's also the gamma. We've been talking about gamma this whole time. Now we're gonna talk about the color gamut. Another thing you should know in case you're new to Sony is that the picture profiles aren't different. They're all just containers. There's defaults for them that have different things loaded into the gamut and the gamma, but you could go into PP6 and make it exactly like PP10 or make, make all of them exactly the same if you wanted to. It's up to you to customize. So this one is PP off, which I already told you is the same thing as PP off, Creative Style Standard is the same thing as Movie Gamma with Movie Color. And we're gonna go over here to the vector scope and we're gonna analyze the colors on the vector scope. Now, a perfect vector scope, this is how we're gonna gauge the accuracy, would have each one of these sort of color dots falling into each of the respective boxes. So you see how the red dot is almost in the box and same with the magenta, but the cyan and the green are a little bit further away. So ideally you would have each one fall into that, and then the skin tone, which is this blurry sort of beige blob here, should fall close to the skin tone line. So if you look at a vector scope and it has all those things happening, you have accurate color. And that's all I can really comment on because accuracy is objective and we have a scope to analyze it. But whether or not you lick a color or not is subjective. So if I say that a color is bad, it doesn't mean that you can't use it or that you can't like it. All I can really tell you is which color gamut will be the easiest to give you accurate color. So let's do that. So Good thing is that the creative style standard or movie movie color is actually pretty good. Like this result here, I know it's not perfect, but it gives a pretty good result. And you can see me up here, if maybe we just expand. This is what I look like, and I think, I think that's a pretty good result. Um, so I'm happy with the movie color. And this next one is PP off neutral. Now you cannot achieve this look by using movie gamma PP1. You have to put in PP off because you can only change the creative, the creative styles when you're not using a picture profile, which is unfortunate because creative style neutral is probably my favorite straight out of camera color for accuracy. You can see in the vector scope, it's pretty darn good. And I think that the image looks great. I think it looks fantastic actually. This is cinema color. Cinema color is not accurate at all. You can see in the vector scope, it's all over the map. I look, I don't know, blue and pink or something. It's, it's not good. Then let's go to pro. Same thing, Pro's a little bit better, but it's not that much better. The vector scope still looks pretty rough. I look kind of magenta, and again, a little bit too cool, which is strange because the white balance was all dialed in for all of these shots. So we're really just seeing what the color is doing. Next up, we have ITU709 Matrix. This is one that I would put in the sort of like decent category. The previous two, Cinema and Pro, they're in the bad category. ITU709 Matrix is decent, but it does require some tweaking, but it's, it's okay. Then we've got S gamut. Now for these, I'm using the color space transform built into resolve because if I turn it off, then you can see this is not going to be a useful 
thing to compare. And because this is the way that I recommend doing it, it's the easiest thing. You just use a transform and then you can evaluate the color. Now I found that the S gamut transform isn't as good as the S gamut three cine one. And again, I think that depends on, you know, how well something's used, how well it's documented, you know, how refined it's been. It's okay. S gamut's pretty good, but I'd probably put it in that decent category where it requires some tweaking. But if we switch over to S log three with S gamut three cine, this result is excellent just using the same transform, but in this case, I'm using the S gamut three cine transform. The best result of all I found for S gamut three cine is to use ACES. Uh, but again, that's probably gonna be limited to a resolve or otherwise workflow. It's not really gonna work in Premiere Pro or Final Cut. So in that case, use LUT calc. But anyway, the vector scope looks good. And this image I think looks fantastic. And that's just using the resolve color space transform. Nice and saturated, good accurate color. What else do we got here? Okay, so now for HLG, this one is HLG with the BT2020. And again, I had to use a color space transform for this because I had to convert the, 20, the Rec 2020 color to Rec 709, but that's all I did. And the result is great. We've got really good accuracy on the vector scope, maybe a little bit on the, on the red magenta side for the skin. So you might wanna pull that in a little bit, but I think the result is pretty good overall. I am kind of a pink person, so. And now lastly though, this is HLG with 709 color. Vector scope is, is vector scope's back to like cinema color, pro color mode. And we're back to that kind of blue, pink, doesn't look good thing. So the in-camera 709 modes, I don't really like. So if I were to shoot HLG, I would use 2020 and then convert it using a transform or a LUT to bring that to 709 and you'll get much better results. And your footage will still be 2020 if you need to do HDR in the future versus baking in 709 with worse color and then needing to tweak it. So those are my rankings. The HLG 709, the Cinema Color and the Pro Color, nope. ITU 709 Matrix and S Gamut, okay, but require tweaking. Standard Color, neutral if you're shooting with PP off, and S Log or S Gamut 3 Cine all give really great results. So the simplest one, I suppose, would either just shoot standard or shoot S Log 3 with S Gamut 3 Cine and throw a transform on. Okay, quick note about detail, which is the third and probably the last setting that you need to customize on the picture profiles. The log profiles, which I think are PP7 and PP8, had the detail set to minus seven by default, where all the other profiles have it set to zero. And there's a significant difference in the sharpening of the image between detail at zero and detail at minus seven. And I'm gonna show you here, I've got two shots. This one, is, they're both uh, S-Log3. I just turned the detail from minus seven up to zero. So let's zoom in here. This is detail minus seven. Look at this text and then I'll click on detail zero. You can see it's much sharper looking. And normally I advise to turn the detail down to minus seven because I'd rather that you just add this back in post to taste rather than have it baked in because it can make noise look worse because it harshens the edges and it can do some kind of weird sort of artifacty things. So this is the image with no with detail at minus seven. Look at the space above the letter A and then look at this one. You see how it kind of adds these little artifacty blocks of color and adds this kind of weird sort of shadow above the A. I'll just flip back and forth a little bit. So that is what the sharpness does and or the detail does. And you can't really undo that. And with certain shots, it looks worse. And you don't want to have to blur your image to get rid of it. You'd better off be shooting with the low detail and then adding a little bit. Now, if you're trying to like run and gun and not have any work to do in post, then yes, you could set the detail in. But I would advise probably like minus two, minus three, not any more than that, because once you get to zero and above that, it it gets pretty severe and it does start to damage the edges of your image. Okay, let's put this all together and talk about which profile is best. But how do you decide what best means? Is it best dynamic range? In that case, it's easy. It's S-Log3. Best low light? Well, we kind of disproved that already. There's no such thing. Gamma doesn't produce noise and any profile can be pushed down in post to have a similar noise level if they're all exposed to the right. A quick note on overexposing with S-Log, by the way. People often say that you shouldn't overexpose it because it can cause problems with skin and so on if you push them too high. And this is only partly true. There is a limit to overexposure and the very last stop can have issues with saturation and channel clipping. But the whole point of log is to distribute information evenly across all the stops, which I showed you on the waveform for S-Log3. So by its very nature, it shouldn't lose quality from overexposing, which is different than a knee in the other gammas, which yes, the knee is actually compressing the highlights and reducing the information in the upper register. A proper log profile shouldn't do this, at least not across the majority of the stops. So so my advice is that you're safe to overexpose as long as you're not trying to pull maximum detail out of the very edge of the last stop. That's when you run into problems. 
but there's also diminishing returns on that anyway. Usually that issue only occurs in the 2.5 to three stops overexposure range, but after two stops overexposed, you're not gonna see much more benefit to noise reduction compared to the 1.66 stops I advised. So you're likely safe if you follow my 55% middle gray advice, just be mindful of your skies. Sometimes you'll have to choose between protecting a bright sky and reducing noise, just the way it goes. So based on all that, why doesn't everyone just shoot log if it's the best profile all around? Well, a lot of it comes down to ease of use, or at least a perception about how easy it is to use. If you're working with log the right way, I would argue it's easier to use than any other profile on these Sony cameras. It gets hard if you try to correct it manually, but don't do that. I have a couple videos on this already, which I'll link below, but the gist is that you should be using a LUT, a transform, or something like ACES to correct your log footage, not doing it manually. Conversely, most of the seemingly easier color gamuts require manual tweaking to dial an accurate color, and the gammas that have sufficient contrast straight at a camera require manual adjustment of the super whites to improve the dynamic range. And manual adjustment, even with non-log images, when you don't have a lot of experience, is where things can get ugly, which is why LUTs and transforms for log are actually easier and produce better results. Pretty much every profile requires some form of contrast or saturation adjustment, so there really is no easy profile. So if you're gonna be doing a little bit of work in post, what could be easier than just plopping on a LUT or a transform? And if you're using DaVinci Resolve, this is as simple as using a CST node to change your input gamut and gamma to Rec. 709. But if you're using Premiere or Final Cut, you can just use a LUT for this. And you can use LUT Calc to make your own LUT for free. Again, I have a whole video on this, but this process makes S-Log and HLG quite easy to work with because you just convert them and then make basic contrast and saturation adjustments to taste. And yes, you should be converting HLG as well because you'll get best results by transforming the 2020 color to 709 rather than just using the in-camera 709 mode, which is very inaccurate. To make your life easier though, I'll create and upload some basic conversion LUTs for you. Look for them in the description. Usually LUTs and transforms are designed for neutral exposure though. So if you're overexposing to reduce noise, you'll need to lower your exposure in post first, then apply the LUT, then do your contrast adjustments after that. You can put the LUT on so that you can see how overexposed it is, but just make sure that the exposure correction step is happening earlier in the processing chain in the editor of your choice. I demonstrated this with the offset node, lowering that earlier in the chain than the conversion node here in Resolve for that one image. So that's my advice. I recommend S-Log3 because it gives you the most dynamic range and there's already a vast collection of LUTs and transforms out there for it because it's such a well-documented profile. And if you expose correctly, it's the best image you can get out of the A7S III. But I know that many of you also wanna know what the best run and gun profile is or the best for streaming, etc. For that, we should look at two things. What gamma is the most broadcast ready and what color mode is the most finished and accurate to pair with. For that, there's only two answers. Cine2 and HLG. However, I know that some of you are still having issues with HLG workflows and the workflow changes depending on the NLE and I already complained about the 709 version of HLG on this camera. So I'd say the simplest answer is Cine2. It clips at 100, so there's no super whites to worry about in post. It exposes naturally and you get the what you see is what you get effect. For color, the best straight out of camera color mode is probably movie as we already showed, which is essentially the same as using creative style standard when the picture profiles are turned off. Personally, I prefer Creative Style Neutral, and I wish I could use that with Cine2, but it's not possible to do that. The reason why I'd use Neutral is because Cine2 requires a bit of additional contrast, in my opinion, and Neutral requires a bit of saturation, so they go well together, because when using Cine2 with Movie, when you add contrast, you'll probably want to reduce the saturation a little too, because Movie Color can be pretty intense, where with Neutral Color, you'd boost them both evenly, and it'd probably look great. But again, there's no profile that's perfect right out the gate. But Cine2 with movie color is probably the closest you're gonna get. And if you put the detail at minus two or minus three, you'll have a solid image straight out of camera. But if you find yourself tweaking that image a lot in post, you'll probably be better off just shooting an S-Log3 with s at 3 Cine and using a LUT or a transform. All right, that's enough for now. Every one of the topics that we covered today could probably have several separate videos dedicated to them. And I know that every answer I give just leads to more questions. But I'm just hoping that this video helps you feel more comfortable using your Sony a7S III, or any camera for that matter. And that maybe you'll be able to squeeze a little more quality out of your images and save yourself some time while you're at it. But that's gonna be it for me. I hope you found this video entertaining or at least helpful. And if you did, make sure to leave the old thumbs up and consider subscribing if you haven't already. But if you did not find this video helpful or entertaining, try setting the playback speed to 75%. Yeah, all right. I'm done.